We have a dangerous problem in our world. A problem that is like a disease because it spreads and it deteriorates the health of our community. We call this problem conflict. You don't have to look very far to find conflict. Every time we turn on the news, we see it. Whether it's war in Syria, or there's many, many examples of conflict going on right now. Every time we open our history books, we see shocking examples of conflict. And while some of them ended with positive change, they all resulted in loss and devastation. So these are extreme examples of conflict. But conflict can be more subtle than that. We find conflict in our homes, in our work communities, and goodness knows we find it in our schools. In our high schools, we always talk about high school drama and gossiping and bullying and cyberbullying. It's everywhere. And so why is conflict so prevalent in our societies and in our world? Um, we could talk all day about this question. <laughs> we could discuss it all year. In fact, you could get an entire master's degree researching this question and theories of conflict. But I only have time to point out a couple things. So there is a famous philosopher named Martin Buber. He wrote a book called I Am Now. And he, psychologists quote him a lot. And, and his theory is that we can view the world in two different ways. I can view the world in an I-thou way, that I see people equal to me. I recognize they have needs and emotions just like I do. Or I could see the world in an I-it way, or me and it, that I relate to people like they're objects, that somehow they're less human than I am, and they don't matter as much. So I feel justified in mistreating them because they're just objects. I know this theory is true because when we're driving in traffic, it's really easy to swear and flip people off, right? Because they're, we don't see their faces. They're distant from us. We don't really think about how that might make them feel. Um, but it's a lot harder to swear and flip off our, at, swear at our friends because they're in front of us and we see them and it's easy to recognize them as people. But it's not the proximity that matters. It's the fact that when we perceive others as different, it becomes harder for us to understand them. We distance ourselves from them. We attach negative labels to them, and suddenly we dehumanize them, and they become objects to us. And this is one thing that can create conflict. Now, put that on top of the stress and anxiety that we experience. When we're stressed out, the the fight or flight response takes over our, our bodies, and that also affects our brain. It aff affects the prefrontal cortex of our brain, which is the part of the brain that manages, manages everything else going on. And it helps us to think things through before we act impulsively. It helps us to be able to understand other people around us. And so when we're stressed out, a part doesn't work as well. And we know that students in our schools are experiencing a lot of stress. But all is not lost. We have a wonderful tool that is a crucial element of conflict resolution. It's something that experts say can help resolve any kind of problem. We call it empathy. What exactly is empathy? There's various definitions, but essentially what it is is the ability to understand, recognize other people's emotions and needs, and to be able to respond appropriately. So where exactly does empathy come from? It starts in our brain. We have amazing, amazing neurons in our brain. We have some mirror, uh, neurons called mirror neurons that act like a mirror to other people's brains. So maybe you've seen someone take a bite of a sour lemon and your mouth starts to salivate as if you can taste it. Or maybe you've seen someone laugh and you start laughing uncontrollably even though you don't know what's so funny, but their laughter triggered that. Or maybe you see someone cry and it makes you sad. Our brains have this amazing ability to mirror other people's, and it helps us to understand the experience and emotions of those around us. But the mirror neuron is just one tiny part of a whole system in our brain that allows us to empathize with others. The system is called the empathy circuit. And another key part of the empathy circuit is that front part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, which shuts down when we're overly stressed. 
The empathy circuit was discovered by Professor Simon Baron Cohen and his colleagues at Cambridge University. They wanted to be able to measure empathy to see where it came from, and so they, they came up with a test to measure empathy. They sampled the population and measured people's levels of empathy, and they found our statistical friend, the bell curve. Exactly what we would expect to see, that most people have average empathy, uh, some people have very low empathy, and some people have very high empathy. A common misconception that we have about empathy is that it's this magical personality trait that you either have or don't. You're born with it or you're not. And wherever you land on this bell curve is where you're stuck forever. We don't really think of empathy as a skill that can be learned, like learning the piano or basketball. But what these researchers found is really fascinating. They created training videos for, to help people with low empathy. And I decided to test these videos out. So what they are is basically showing people's faces, people of all different ages, and showing different emotions, happy and sad, and um, teaching what these emotions are. And then after people go through the trainings, they test them again and show them faces and say, what is this person feeling? And then they test them. Is this person depressed, happy, annoyed? And the amazing thing is that people who go through these trainings, are, their levels of empathy actually increase. They're learning cognitive empathy and emotion recognition. And other experts like Paul Ekman are creating similar trainings to this that they use in federal government agencies and big corporations that pay lots of money to train their employees to learn empathy. And why are they doing that? Why are they paying so much money to teach empathy? Well, probably because, um, as psychologists like Daniel Goleman point out, people with higher levels of empathy are more likely to be successful in jobs such as managing, business, teaching, counseling, and the list goes on. And people who have higher levels of empathy also rate themselves as being happier in their, in their relationships. So if empathy is so crucial in our work life, in our home life, and everywhere, and it's something that can be learned, why aren't we teaching it in schools? Now, there are organizations out there that promote teaching empathy in schools. And a lot of them will go into schools, and I've seen these great assemblies where they teach, don't bully, accept everyone, be friends with everyone. And it's great. It's really inspiring for students. But the problem is that if we wanted our students to learn, say, math, we wouldn't give them one math assembly every year and then cross our fingers that they'll get the math they need at home and outside of school. Of course, students would love that, but it probably wouldn't be very effective. So what do we do? The curriculum for our students is so full. How do we incorporate empathy into it? We can't add an, an empathy class. Maybe we could, but maybe there's a way we could incorporate empathy into existing curriculum. Um, so what we've done at our school this year is I've tried a new experiment to try and incorporate thinking empathically into history. So I teach a class called Global Studies. And in it, I really want to teach the students about conflict. I want to teach them that even though there's conflict all over our world, that there's ways that we can confront and resolve conflict, and that there's organizations out there that are doing positive things to, to change our world. And so what we do in this class is we study regions of the world, um, and we study conflicts in regions of the world. So we study conflicts in Asia and Africa, Europe, the Middle East, South America, all over the world. And we'll take a conflict and analyze it and learn history that way. Um, and then we also learn about conflict theory and the United Nations and their work in peace building and, and spreading positive things. So one example that we learned about this year is a common conflict that most people have heard of between Israel and Palestine. Um, and in classes like this, it's pretty common to have like a debate where you say, Let's look at both sides of the story. What, what do you think is right and wrong? And defend your opinion. And that's good. But we've tried to limit that type of debate in our class. And instead, we ask, why does this side think they're right and they're wrong? Why does this side think they're right and they're wrong? What is it in their culture, in their history, in their life experiences that has caused them to think in this way and to believe this, this way? And then we, instead of having a debate, we'll sit around the table and maybe eat Middle Eastern food and just think about their culture and their experiences and try to 
will say, okay, you're, this half of the class is the political leaders of Israel, this half is the political leaders of Palestine, and maybe a third group will be like the United Nations. And instead of debating, we'll try to come up with a peace treaty or something, a, a plan to resolve the conflict. So they have to learn the history to be able to do this. Um, so we're not looking at training videos of emotions and faces to learn empathy, but what we're doing is trying to put ourselves in the shoes of people that are different from us. We're looking at videos of their lives and saying, what would it be like to experience this? What, what is it like for them to go through this? And, and try to understand other people's perspectives. So we're trying to train our brains to ask the right questions in remembering to use empathy. Um, and this might seem like a lot to add into a history class, but I find that it's really effective for the students to learn history because they make th this personal connection with it and they become passionate about it and engaged and they start asking all the right questions. When did this conflict start? Uh, are other countries involved? How long has it been going on? Why do they believe this? And it's like they've already guessed all the lesson objectives before we even start. And it's amazing. I love, as a teacher, seeing my students become so enthusiastic about history and politics. But what I love probably even more than that is when we have time to try to compare these conflicts into um, our personal conflicts. Because we use techniques, mediation and conflict resolution techniques from the United Nations and Harvard, and we adapt those for the high school students to understand so that they can learn techniques. And um, so it's really cool. There's been times where I'll go out into the lunch area on my lunch duty and see students talking to their friends and trying to resolve their friends' conflicts and saying, oh, you're fighting with your girlfriend? Well, let's talk about how we can resolve this. And they use the concepts and techniques that we learned and the vocabulary in our class and try to help their friends. And it's so touching to me to see, wow, I, I, I think that this class is making a difference for them. I hope that it is. And so I just, this is a new experiment that I'm doing and still um, creating the curriculum for this class and thinking how can this help our students and how can I help them to learn to resolve conflict and think empathically? Now, I know that there's a lot of teachers out there who are really experienced and really creative that could think of other creative ways to incorporate thinking empathically into their classroom and teaching students these valuable skills. And as we do that, um, to be able to teach empathy, we have to exemplify empathy. So you don't have to be a teacher. You can be a parent, a friend, a child, a brother, a sister, anybody. If we can learn to use our empathy, then we can be teachers of empathy. And as we do that, we can help make our communities better. We can teach our students the skills that they need to become future leaders. And it will help us to build peace and to resolve problems and conflict. As per, because as Professor Simon Baron Cohen said, empathy is a universal solvent. Any problem immersed in empathy becomes soluble. Thank you.